Welcome back to Public Speaking. Today we're going to introduce topics related to Chapter 5 as we talk about the salient traits of public speaking and discuss how to develop topics for formal presentations later this semester or term. Let's begin with an article by Thomas Kolopoulos, Seven Really Bad Pieces of Advice About Public Speaking. In this instance, Kolopoulos is going to give a good piece of advice that he gives his charges that he mentors in the art of speech making. Kolopoulos writes, I make a hundred dollar bet with each of my speaking protégés that they cannot over emote in front of a live audience in 20 years. I haven't once lost the bet. It's all recorded so that they can see the truth afterwards. The reason is that we all have an instinctive reaction to tone ourselves down when we're in front of an audience. It's a survival mechanism that is intended to give us the chance to size up a situation when we're outnumbered. That works when you have the time and the luxury to do it. You don't have that luxury in front of an audience. You need to be who you are and amplify your personality. Putting yourself out there shows that you are vulnerable, yet comfortable and confident in yourself and your message. People respond to that. Well, how can we get people to respond to our identities? Now that we've talked about our personalities, and we've even given a speech upon our group identities, we're going to spend the next several lecture and discussion sections honing our skills so that we can amplify those identities even more in public forums. So today we're going to be talking about the three most important traits of public speaking integrity, rapport, and credibility. In the past, you might have heard these described as logos, pathos, and ethos, but we're going to use these terms because they're a bit more amenable and accessible to contemporary audiences. So let's break down what each of these things have in common with each other, and we're going to begin by discussing credibility, which we'll define as the level of believability conveyed by the message to a recipient. Notice that credibility is message-centric. In other words, it pertains to the content of your speech. Speakers often communicate credibility via the strength and satisfaction of their message. The strength refers to the evidence and the logic that reinforces that message, especially a persuasive one, and satisfaction refers to how much a message meets the needs desires or wants of its audience. That means that credibility tends to be more audience reliant. In other words, we can't necessarily choose how our credibility is going to be assessed unless we can understand a bit about our spectators. Credibility increases and deviates based upon the speaker's relationship to their spectators. So the warmer your relationship with your audience, the more likely it is that they'll respond favorably to your credibility. Here are some core ideas related to credibility and establishing it in your speeches. One idea is transfer. This is where you try to marry especially persuasive messages with credible personalities. If you've ever started a physics paper by quoting Albert Einstein, then you know what transfer is. Expertise refers to an audience's perceived degree of knowledge in the speaker. In other words, even if you don't know what you're talking about, if the audience perceives that you are an expert in your field, they're more likely to respond favorably to your credibility. And finally, appropriateness. This is the spectrum of risk and reward derived from a message. In other words, the more risk an audience has to undertake to accept a message, the less likely they'll be able to ascribe credibility to that speech. To use an illustration of appropriateness, Think about the last time someone tried to get you to purchase something or invest in something that was an especially strenuous cost. Regardless of the potential reward, you probably more carefully weighed the credibility of the message. And that's true for all audiences. So how can you then establish credibility during a presentation? Number one, don't be afraid to borrow from an array of careworn sources. Quote, Albert Einstein if you're talking about physics, or use the words of a famous comedian if you're discussing humor and comedy. Demonstrate your understanding to voices of dissent in your proposition. 
In other words, if you're trying to persuade an audience, bake into the DNA of your speech, dissenting opinions, and your projected response to those opinions, so that you can demonstrate to your audience you've thought through all opinions and arrived at your own conclusions. And finally, carefully frame the meaning of the presentation, success or failure. The introduction is usually the best place to do this, as you share how you're going to measure your own success or failure based upon the outcomes of the speech. Oftentimes, presentations that have strong credibility have a higher mnemonic quality. That's a fancy way of saying that the more credibility your presentation has, the more memorable it will be in the minds of your audience. And as you might expect, low credibility can severely impact identical messages in other speakers. Let's put some of these observations to a test. We're going to do a diagnostic workshop on celebrity endorsements. As you remember, we talked about one idea related to credibility, transfer, where you take the identity of a person and borrow their credibility in order to embolden your own message. So as you carefully watch the following foreign commercials, I'd like you to identify how each advertisement uses transference to convey meaning to an audience. バイオレン。食べ比べたら分かります。バイオレン。肉の旨味が生きています。糸半だから美味しい。味ける美味しさ。バイオレン。しかも低価格。このメッセージが目立ってない。今回は目立ちます。ダイハツメライス。目立つ
whether you borrow it or create your own. The next trait we're going to discuss is something called rapport, or pathos. And this is the capacity to develop empathy through strategic and stylistic delivery. Remember, your course textbook defines the word empathy as being able to imagine what another person's perspective is like. So, you can establish rapport, especially through careful preparation. First, identify visual, auditory, and kinesthetic congruence with your audience. In other words, you want to break down as many barriers you can in the performance space between you and they. This is especially difficult in formal occasions when there is a larger distance between you and your audience, but it can still be achieved. You can also integrate demographic ideas, values, and experience into your message as well. Another way to put that is put things in the words or ideas of your spectators whenever you use illustrations or other observations in your speech. And finally, create opportunities for what are called yes patterns during the presentation. Another way to say that is you can get your audience to agree on lots of small or incremental patterns before selling them on a big yes. Everybody likes ice cream here, right? Yes. Everybody here would like to have a little bit of extra money, right? Yes. So let me tell you about a part-time job that's opening up at your local Brahms dairy store. Yes. But you wouldn't necessarily have to work very hard for that last yes if you hadn't already laid the groundwork with those first few yeses. Another deviation on the yes pattern is to use something called a no pattern. If you can get someone to say no as early as possible, you can create the same congruence. This house that I'm showing you, it's absolutely terrible, right? Oh, no, 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 no. It has some of the things that I want. But could you show me some others in the area? Notice how the no operates like a yes pattern in that exchange because I'm creating congruence. If the person says, yes, this is absolutely terrible, then they've agreed with you. If they say no, then you still have a conversation because you've shown them the right article. You can use the same formula with your own speeches. So how do you generate rapport via delivery? Number one, marry your audience's linguistic and emotional responses. You see stand-up comedians do this all the time, especially when they bomb. If they tell a bad joke, then they acknowledge the fact that the audience didn't laugh at that joke, and the audience in turn usually laughs at that response. You can reinforce similarities on body position and gesture. In other words, you want to have your body position be equivocal to that of your audience. You could demonstrate persistent attentiveness to audience responses. If they're responding favorably, acknowledge that, or vice versa. And finally, Rapport between the speaker and the audiences can drastically reduce communication apprehension. So if you're a person that suffers from persistent anxiety, just mirroring your audience's body position, language, and emotional responses can often reduce that overall apprehension. Rapport has been known to be the leading indicator of whether an audience will have an active response to the presentation. In other words, Audiences don't always respond because you say the right thing or because you're a good person. But if they like you, they're likely to buy whatever you're selling, whether that's an idea or an actual article. Tell you what, let's look at some images and observe the existence or perhaps absence of rapport. Notice how rapport is being generated in this image. Both of the individuals have similar body positions, gestures, and even notice how the figure on the left, even though they are taller, has reduced their overall size. They are literally attempting to see things from the perspective of the figure on the right. Now compare that to this image. First of all, the figure in the center is outnumbered by the other individuals. Secondly, Everyone's eyes are in different places, and we can tell that the figure in the middle is not very happy at where they are looking. Also looked at the way that the figure in the middle's arms are crossed in a defensive position. 
In the meantime, everyone else is surrounding that person, meaning they're cutting off her route to escape. This is definitely not an image that is conducive to rapport, and you can probably imagine just how successful each of the individuals surrounding the person in the middle is going to be if they try to persuade her. Finally, let's discuss integrity. We can define integrity, or ethos, as the perception of ethical purpose. In other words, while credibility judges content, rapport judges relationship, integrity judges you, the speaker. So speakers are required to cultivate trust with their audiences, and core questions that each audience is going to ask regarding their speaker includes whether or not the speaker is motivated by passion or personal gain. An audience is likely to respond more favorably if they can tell you really care about what you're speaking about. Can the speaker be held accountable to their words? In other words, do they do as they say or do as they do, and does the speaker abide by those stated values, ideas, and observations, or do they exhibit glimmers of hypocrisy? So here are some key applications in establishing your own integrity. Number one, provide chances to fulfill even minimal promises during your presentation. If you, for example, say in your introduction, I'm going to speak about these three things, you need to speak about those three things by the end of your speech. Or, if you say that you're going to provide certain evidence, you need to make sure that you highlight that evidence so that you can prove that you have fulfilled those promises. Share anecdotes of self-sacrifice and value conflict. Audiences love it when you share illustrations or personal anecdotes in which you stuck to your values or beliefs and had to suffer because of it, but you believe in them so strongly that your passion has trumped any personal gain. And finally, display vulnerability and growth at key moments in your development. So it's okay to admit that you've, for example, fail to abide by your stated values, but show your audience that you've learned from your mistakes, and they're more likely to regard you as having a person with relatively high integrity. Typically, audiences respond most favorably to dissenting messages when they perceive the speaker has a certain degree of integrity. In other words, if you're trying to persuade an audience that might be hostile to your message, showing them that you are a quote-unquote good person is the best way to move them towards your position. And finally, speakers exhibiting low integrity are more likely to justify impulsive or dishonest behavior. In other words, slim shady speakers try to get their audiences to do slim shady things. So you might ask yourself whether or not you're above board by looking carefully at the outcomes you want your audience to perform after you've delivered your message. So, authenticity is a big part of establishing your integrity. And in What Consumers Want, Joseph Pine says, You Americans, you like your fantasy environments. You fake your Disneyland experiences. We Dutch, we like real, natural, authentic experiences. So much has that happened that I've developed a fairly practiced response, which is, I point out that first of all, you have to understand, there's no such thing as an inauthentic experience. Why? Because the experience happens inside of us. It's our reaction to the events that are staged in front of us. So as long as we are in any sense authentic human beings, then every experience we have is authentic. Now there may be more or less natural or artificial stimuli for the experience, but even that is a matter of degree, not kind. And there's no such thing as a 100% natural experience. Even if you go for a walk in the proverbial woods, there's a company that manufactured the car that delivered you to the edge of the woods. There's a company that manufactured the shoes that you have to protect yourself from the ground of the woods. There's a company that provides a cell phone service you have in case you get lost in the woods, right? All of those are human-made artificiality brought into the woods by you and by the very nature of being there. So what's Pine trying to tell us? Integrity and authenticity are often in the eyes of the beholder, and what's good to one person might be bad to another. Think about, for example, just how partisan political speeches can become. 
The positions of one candidate can be seen as incredibly ethical and moral to one person, but can be seen as divisive, even oppressive, by another. So you have to know how your audience defines authenticity before you can establish trust with them through your integrity. Think about Disney World, for example. It's a perfect example of a real fake. Everybody knows that Disney World isn't real. That, for example, when you walk down the streets of uh, Main Street, Main Street USA in Disney World, no one actually sells sugar cookies there, even though you can smell sugar cookies because the smells of sugar cookies are being wafted in through vents. But by knowing that, you're still able to enjoy a quote-unquote authentic experience of Disney magic, even though you realize everything around you is artificial. So with that in mind, let's look at these. We've already watched one or two TED speeches here in class, and these are actually the guidelines that every speaker who gives a TED speech should know. Now, I'm not going to read through all of these, but there's a few of them that are worth noting as they directly pertain to the ideas of integrity, rapport, and credibility that we've already discussed today. Thou shalt not simply trot out the usual stick. Integrity. Thou shalt dream a great dream. Show your passion. Again, integrity. Thou shalt tell a story. Rapport. Thou shalt freely comment on the utterances of other speakers. Well, that's the transference that we saw in credibility. Thou shalt not flaunt thine ego. Be thou vulnerable. Notice the same word vulnerable appears in our slide regarding integrity and the Ted Commandments. Thou shalt not sell from the stage. Integrity. Laughter is good. Rapport. Etc. 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 So with that in mind, we're going to look at a presentation from Mark Bezos, the brother of Jeff Bezos. He's a volunteer firefighter who's going to tell a story of an act of heroism that didn't quite go as expected, but that taught him a big lesson. So as you carefully watch, I'd like you to identify which characteristic of presentation values, credibility, rapport, integrity, best conveys the meaning of Bezos's message. <laughs> Back in New York, I am the head of development for a nonprofit called Robin Hood. When I'm not fighting poverty, I'm fighting fires as the assistant captain of a volunteer fire company. Now, in our town, where the volunteers supplement a highly skilled career staff, you have to get to the fire scene pretty early to get in on any action. I remember my first fire. I was the second volunteer on the scene, so there was a pretty good chance I was going to get in. But still, it was a real foot race against the other volunteers to get to the captain in charge to find out what our assignments would be. When I found the captain, he was having a very engaging conversation with the homeowner, who was surely having one of the worst days of her life. Here it was, the middle of the night. She was standing outside in the pouring rain, under an umbrella, in her pajamas, barefoot, while her house was in flames. The other volunteer who had arrived just before me, let's call him... Lex Luthor, <laughs> got to the captain first and was asked to go inside and save the homeowner's dog. The dog! Oh, I was stunned with jealousy. Here was some lawyer or money manager who for the rest of his life gets to tell people that he went into a burning building to save a living creature. Just because he beat me by five seconds. Well, I was next. The captain weighed me over. I said, Bezos, I need you to go into the house. I need you to go upstairs, past the fire, and I need you to get this woman a pair of shoes. <laughs> I swear. So, not exactly what I was hoping for, but off I went. Up the stairs, down the hall, past the real firefighters who were pretty much done putting out the fire at this point, into the master bedroom to get a pair of shoes. Now. I know what you're thinking, but I'm no hero. <laughs> I carried my payload back downstairs where I met my nemesis and the precious dog by the front door. 
We took our treasures outside to the homeowner where, not surprisingly, his received much more attention than did mine. A few weeks later, the department received a letter from the homeowner thanking us for the valiant effort displayed in saving her home. The act of kindness she noted above all others, someone had even gotten her a pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, in both my vocation at Robin Hood and my avocation as a volunteer firefighter, I am witness to acts of generosity and kindness on a monumental scale. But I'm also witness to acts of grace and courage on an individual basis. And you know what I've learned? They all matter. So as I look around this room at people who either have achieved or are on their way to achieving remarkable levels of success, I would offer this reminder. Don't wait. Don't wait until you make your first million to make a difference in somebody's life. If you have something to give, give it now. Serve food at a soup kitchen, clean up a neighborhood park, be a mentor. Not every day is going to offer us a chance to save somebody's life, but every day offers us an opportunity to affect one. So get in the game. Save the shoes. Thank you. So what I love about this particular speech is that Bezos admits, both in his vocation and avocation, he's not a professional public speaker. And since Bezos' speech is approximately the same length as most of our informal or formal presentations, it shows just how much you can do with a little amount of time, even if you're a novice at being a public speaker. So there's a lot of things going on here. Obviously, we saw quite a bit of credibility. The fact that Bezos chose to wear his firefighter uniform lends him a level of expertise. In addition to that, he establishes rapport by first sharing with us vulnerability, his capacity to laugh at himself by being stunned with jealousy, but also the fact that he uses humor to describe, for example, his quote-unquote nemesis. And finally, integrity through both his vulnerability and his learning a lesson demonstrates how you can weave all three aspects of the traits that we've discussed today in a very short amount of time into a speech to deliver an especially powerful message. It can also be done on both a comedic and, as you'll see, a dramatic level. This is just an excerpt from Mary Fisher's address to the Republican National Convention. Less than three months ago, at a platform hearing in Salt Lake City, I asked the Republican Party to lift the shroud of silence which has been draped over the issue of HIV and AIDS. I have come tonight to bring our silence to an end. I bear a message of challenge, not self-congratulation. I want your attention, not your applause. Mary Fisher, as you may know, was a celebrity in the 1970s and 80s. She was diagnosed as HIV positive in the early 90s. So, just four years after President Ronald Reagan had refused to use the word AIDS in any public speeches or addresses, Mary Fisher gave this address in Salt Lake City, Utah, at the Republican National Convention. She continues, I would never have asked to be HIV positive, but I believe that in all things there is a purpose. And I stand before you and before the nation gladly. The reality of AIDS is brutally clear. 200,000 Americans are dead or dying. A million more are infected. Worldwide, 40 million. 60 million or a hundred million infections will be counted in the coming few years. But despite science and research, White House meetings and congressional hearings, despite good intentions and bold initiatives, campaign slogans and hopeful promises, it is despite it all the epidemic which is winning tonight. Tonight, I represent an AIDS community whose members have been reluctantly drafted from every segment of American society. Though I am white, and a mother, I'm one with a black infant struggling with tubes in a Philadelphia hospital. Though I am female and contracted this disease in marriage and enjoy the warm support of my family, I am one with a lonely gay man sheltering a flickering candle from the cold wind of his family's rejection. We may take refuge in our stereotypes, but we cannot hide there long because HIV asks only one thing of those it attacks. Are you human?
And this is the right question. Are you human? Because people with HIV have not entered some alien state of being. They are human. They have not earned cruelty. They do not deserve meanness. They don't benefit from being isolated or treated as outcasts. Each of them is exactly what God made. A person, not evil, deserving of our judgment, not victims, longing for our pity. People, ready for support and worthy of compassion. Notice how Fisher interweaves ideas of integrity, credibility, and even rapport here. For example, when she asks, are you human, not once but twice, first in a demonstrable, credible way, of course we're all human, so that means that we can all contract HIV, because if Mary Fisher, a famous housewife from Salt Lake City, Utah, extremely religious, could contract AIDS in the 1990s, what she is saying is anyone, any human, can contract AIDS as well. But then, she flips that script and asks, are you human on the level of pathos? Can you be compassionate? Can you be caring? And can you be charitable? That's why this speech is listed as probably one of the most 100 important speeches of the 20th century, because of its capacity to interweave both integrity, credibility, and rapport into a single message. All right, folks, that's all we've got for today. Be sure to reach out to me via email if you have any questions about your assignments related to Chapter 5.